Shabbat Shalom. <coughs> As some of you may know, I started a new pulpit on September 9th, 2001, which happened to be located a block from the World Trade Center. So I was the rabbi of the synagogue closest to ground zero on 9-11, and I was a full 48 hours into my job. Coming up on September 11th at the Dupree, I'm going to be teaching a class on some of the spiritual lessons that I learned from that experience. But I want to share with you today a question that arose for me that day, which is surprisingly practical even now in my rabbi, and I think really relevant to all of us. So after 9-11, there were thousands killed. There were also thousands, tens of thousands made homeless. All of the southern tip of Manhattan was evacuated. So almost every member of my congregation was a refugee. Although, unlike what typically happens, these were not your typical refugees from a natural disaster. I actually called them the second homeless. Because I have to leave, I guess I will have to stay at my place in the Hamptons. So the Red Cross and FEMA came in and they wanted to help, and they are used to, okay, a tornado destroyed my trailer, great, we will put you in the Red Roof Inn for $48 a night. Well, let's see, the Four Seasons has a discounted rate of 680. We will cover your mortgage till you get back on your feet. No worries, my payment on my loft is $100,000 a month. They had no idea what to do. This was just not something they'd ever considered. This was a disaster that was beyond their conception of what a disaster was meant to be. But it raised the question for me of when you are helping people, when you are giving charity, whether you take into account what their needs or expectations were independent of where they find themselves now. How much is appropriate to give, and should everyone get the same, or does it matter where someone started? And this is something that I think about all the time because we have a discretionary fund at B'nai Torah, <coughs> and so I routinely give out thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year to people in our community who are in need, or one way or the other, facing a job loss, facing a challenge, whatever it might be. And I wrestle with the fact that we are in suburbia, right? That these are not people at risk of being second homeless, right? But nevertheless, right, that our lifestyle is different from that that you might expect from someone, right, who you're giving a dollar to in the street. Or I thought about it for myself. So there was a point where in my own life, we thought maybe it is time to apply for financial aid for day school. Because having three kids in day school, we joked that it was like dri driving a minivan off a cliff every year. Um, and that was before I was as rich and famous as I am now. Of course, now I have two kids in private college, so that is actually like driving a Maserati off a cliff and sideswiping a minivan on the way over. <laughs> and by the way, the people who run those schools don't even like my kids as much as the people at Epstein did. <laughs> but the question is, right, so who am I? Right, living a relatively comfortable suburban lifestyle, I get to go on vacation, I have two reasonably new cars, right, to be asking for financial aid. So let me take you through a couple of sources from our tradition that I think give us guidance into how to think about this question. <coughs> so our Torah portion this week, there's a portion, actually the second half of the portion, the fifth and sixth aliyot in particular, talk about different ways that we help people in need. There's a mitzvah of maaser, giving a tenth of what one has to the poor, the idea that if someone needs a loan, you give it to them. There are so many different ways in which we are commanded to help those in need. And it says, de machsuro, asher yechsarlo. In Hebrew, the amount that he is missing, that is missing to him, that which he needs. And the idea 
is, and the rabbis debate this, but the idea is that it is not just in some absolute amount, but the amount that is missing to him. And so Hillel, the sage, you've heard of him, they named the place on campus after him. <coughs> he said, even a horse to ride and a slave to ride before him. And so they say that there was a case where there was a man who had been born into a rich family, so he expected to live a certain way, and he became poor, and he bought for him a horse to ride and a slave to run before him. One time he did not find someone to run before him, and so he himself ran before him for three miles. So to translate it to modern terms, this guy needed a ride. We did not get him Uber X. We got Uber Black for this dude, right? That we went above and beyond because he was not used to riding in the back of a Civic. And so what, what Hillel would say, it would seem, is that <clears throat> when we support someone who is need, we keep in mind who they were before they started. So if someone was used to living certain certain lifestyle, the goal is to restore them to the lifestyle they had previously. And a similar story, Mar Ukva had a poor man in his neighborhood to whom he regularly sent 400 zoos on the eve of every day of atonement. If you learn how much 400 zoos is, a ketubah specifies what alimony is for a year, and that is 200 zuzim, right? So this is like two divorces worth of money, right? Or if you prefer at the Seder, tre zuze, two zuzim is the amount you can use to buy a small goat that then the cat eats, and then the dog bites it, and then the stick, and all, you know where that goes. <coughs> and so his son goes to deliver the money, and he says, the son comes back and says, you are throwing your money away. This does not, guy does not need your help. And Marukba says, why? He said, I saw that in this guy's house, they're using basically um, aged wine as perfume, right? So basically, they are literally like, they are living large. And Marukba says, they're so delicate, send them 800 zuzim, they need it. So these are actually two rather remarkable stories of the sages, right? That in fact, <coughs> you are supposed to give not based on some absolute level, right? You should have a roof over your head. You should have basic meals, right? You can eat ramen noodles like the rest of us. No, like if you're used to eating a good cut of steak, then by gosh, we need to get you a good cut of steak, it would seem. So if you want to ask, according to these sages, how much should you give? They would quote Credence Clear wrote a revival and say, they always answer more. <coughs> Those are the stories. The law gives us a little bit of a different answer. So Mishnah Peah, so a legal code, the first one found in the Mishnah, gives us actually amounts that if someone is has 200 Zuzim, they are not allowed to take the things designated for the poor. So if you remember, I said 400 zuzim, so if you have half that, you are not entitled to take forgotten sheaves or the corners of the field or the poor man's tithe. <coughs> On the other hand, if you are in debt, so if you had 200 zuzim, but they, your debts outweigh that, they are mortgaged to someone, then that's okay. And they don't force someone to sell his house or his tools. So maybe there is a limit, right, that look, if you have this much money, you don't need our help, come back when you're actually poor. But on the other hand, if you are facing a situation where you might have money, but it's tied up in your house, or you might have money, but it is actually, you have tools, but you need them to work, then you actually still do need our help. The source ends by saying, that if someone doesn't need and ends up taking, they will end up actually becoming impoverished. So that in fact, it is a recurring cycle. If you take money that you don't need, eventually you will come to really need that karma will come and get you. <clears throat> so what do we do? How do we balance these sources? And by the way, I've left aside the whole question of people Right. These are people who are honest. This is what I have, this is what I don't have. Let alone the people who are trying to game the system. Right? The person who says, we really need a dues reduction, and then they see on Facebook they're riding around in their boat on the lake. I'm like, okay. 
not second homeless. How do we know what is the right amount to give? And what do we give? So there's the story of the kid who, as he is going to Ged and prays, God, please heal those who are sick. God, please give food to those who are hungry. God, please give homes to those who are homeless. And please give clothing to all the people at my older brother's computer. Maimonides tells us that will hit eventually, and then it's not good. <laughs> Maimonides tells us that a poor person who is unknown and says, I'm hungry, you don't check after him because if someone's coming, you say, I literally have no food to eat, you don't debate. Like, and similarly, if someone comes to you and says, I have no clothing, that's something that is immediately obvious, right? Um, but even so, they say, see if he's lying because me, people might lie about not having clothing, even though they will not lie about whether they're hungry or not. But I think for us, the challenge is we live in a world where we are presented with so many different kinds of needs. And where sometimes, by the way, we ourselves ask, are we justified in asking? And I think the answer is that the Torah says, Laman achicha imach, that your brother should live amongst you. That in fact, there is a goal in the tradition that people should be able to be supported to get back to the place where they came from. That peace should be, people should be supported. That they're always going to be rich and poor, the Torah says. That should, people should never feel like they are so low that they have no place, that they can't show their face in the community. That everyone should feel like they can stand tall and proud and be able to be in the school with everyone else. That everyone should feel like that they, can't, they don't have to move away because they can't afford to live where they used to live. The practicalities of how you do this are complicated, but it's important for us to remember that the way that one feels need if one was doing well is different, not better or worse, but different from the way that one feels need if one was always needy. And our tradition asks us to be sensitive to the fact that where you start has an impact on where you feel you are at that moment, and we have an obligation to help everyone feel a sense of dignity. Shabbat Shalom.